Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to our program. I'm really excited about our program today. This program is Where the Past Meets the Future, Innovative Approaches to National Park Outreach. My name is Megan Gregonis. I'm the U.S. Consul General here in Munich at the U.S. Consulate, and we are a co-host for tonight's program. And first of all, I want to give a shout out to our partners. That's America House in Munich and Berchtesgaden National Park. And especially warm welcome also to our National Park trio, Shelton, Klaus, and Claire, and to all of the nature lovers out there. Last week, we celebrated both Earth Day and Transatlantic Innovation Week. Earth Day was launched in 1970 to honor our planet, to praise its beauty, and to raise awareness of its vulnerability. We celebrate it every year on April 22nd. Transatlantic Innovation Week is a newer invention. It's a campaign that we, the US mission in Germany, that is our embassy in Berlin and the five consulates, launched just this year. Consulate Munich actually hatched this idea and we led the organization for all of Germany from Munich. Our goal was to work with multiple partners to highlight the huge resourcefulness on both sides of the Atlantic, as well as the wonderful and very strong partnership between our countries. We also emphasize that there are threats to our inventions and that we need to take necessary precautions to protect our innovations and our planet, and that diversity and inclusion are the drivers of this transatlantic resourcefulness. You might ask yourself how these two go together, the earth and innovation. I believe the answer is quite naturally. Nature has been formed over billions of years and a growing global population is increasingly leaving its imprint on mother nature. This is where I think innovation comes in. In February, the White House launched its Climate Innovation Initiative. Research and investments in transformational clean energy are at the forefront of this effort. And at last week's Leader Summit on Climate, both the United States and Germany pledged to spearhead this effort and both strengthened existing commitments. There is such beauty on this planet and we need to preserve it. The Berchtesgaden and Yosemite National Parks are prime examples. Their immense biodiversity, their mountain forests and lakes fill us with awe. And despite their differences, they have a lot in common. Fittingly, they formed an official partnership in 2014 and they have been sister parks ever since. Protecting and sharing the natural beauty in these sister parks is the main task of our three guests tonight. Let me start by introducing Klaus. Klaus Melde, a native Berchtesgadener, has been a park ranger with Berchtesgaden National Park for close to two decades. Among his early childhood memories are fishing excursions to the Austrian Salzkammergut on the other side of the border from Bavaria, together with his dad, complete with tent and campfire. His father operated an Esso gas station. For us in the US, that's the Exxon gas station. And that's where Klaus first got in touch with Americans, the US soldiers from the nearby barracks. He stayed in contact with some of them and visited them in the late 1980s as part of an extensive trip that led him all across America. Klaus loves American country music and once was a proud owner of a Harley Davidson. An electrician by training, Klaus joined the Berchtesgaden National Park at the beginning of this millennium, which was somewhat of a homecoming for him and a reconnection with nature. Klaus, you and Claire are joining us tonight from the Haus der Berge, or the House of Mountains, Berchtesgaden's truly impressive information and education center. I have visited the Haus der Berge, by the way, on a few occasions, including for the 40th anniversary of the park in 2018. I wish you a very warm welcome this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shelton Johnson has been a park ranger with the U.S. National Park Service for more than 30 years. Over the course of his ranger career, Shelton has developed and presented interpretive programs to the public in some of our most famous parks in the United States, including the Yellowstone National Park, National Capital Parks, Great Basin, and his current workplace, Yosemite National Park. As a child, he spent a year and a half here in Germany, accompanying his father, who was stationed with the US military in the Rhineland Palatinate. I hope that his childhood experiences will figure prominently in the ensuing discussion tonight. And you should also know that Shelton's fondness of Bavaria goes beyond nature. 
as a hardcore classical music fan, he counts recordings of the symphony orchestra of the Bayerischer Rundfunk among his all-time favorites. Shelton continues to surprise us as a man of many talents. He is a trained clarinetist and an English literature graduate from the University of Michigan. His penchant for literature and history led him to author a book, Glory Land, on, on the so-called Buffalo Soldiers, the African-American regiments patrolling the national parks in California at the turn of the 20th century. Prior to his ranger career, Shelton served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Liberia, teaching English to vocational students. In case you didn't know, Shelton is a celebrity among rangers. He is the recipient of the 2009 National Freeman Tilden Award, the highest annual award given by the National Park Service for interpretation. He appeared, or rather starred, in U.S. filmmaker Ken Burns' acclaimed six-episode 2009 series on our public broadcasting system, The National Parks, America's Best Idea. He met with President Barack Obama, both at the White House and in Yosemite National Park, and at Shelton's invitation, Oprah Winfrey spent considerable time at Yosemite. What an amazing career. We know that you engaged audiences in Baden-Württemberg, home of the Black Forest National Park last week, Shelton. As excited as we are to have you with us virtually, we also want you to come back in person in the near future to revisit the sites of your childhood. So give us a call when you're ready. Finally, I would like to welcome Claire Faltzner Gibbon, also from Berchtesgaden National Park, where she works in the research section. She has kindly agreed to moderate tonight's discussion. Claire, Klaus, and Shelton, the floor or screen is all yours. Thanks, Megan, a lot. Uh, so before we start the discussion, um, I just uh, to our viewers say that questions can be asked during the panel the, the whole time, just in a chat, and we'll come back to them later. So to start off the discussion, um, I would first like to ask Shelton uh, if you, you've got a special connection to Bavaria and especially Bess Garden. So if you just could tell us a bit about that and take us down memory lane, that would be great. Sure. Uh, my connection essentially hinges on my father being stationed uh, at, at an Air Force base uh, near um, Zweibrücken. Zweibrücken was the, the, the town that we actually lived in. And I, I remember Kuntwig, or Kuntwig was another name of the, another closer town. But uh, there was a family trip to Berchtesgaden when I was about five years of age. And it was more than a family trip. I, I think of it more of as a baptism uh, into the world, into the world of mountains, into the sky, uh, into something greater than, than we have created as a species. And I, I wasn't thinking along those lines at the time. All I was aware of is that I was standing at the, the brink of, a, of an abyss and I could look down and I can see the clouds uh, drifting by. I could see the shadows of those clouds drifting in the earth thousands of feet beneath me. And I, I looked up and there was a blue sky with clouds and, and a light was shafting through the clouds and illuminating the peaks. And I can see it today as I, as I saw it and I, as I felt it yesterday. And I was holding the hands of my parents, you know, both hands uh, were being gripped by their hands. And, and I can still feel that pressure in my hands today when I think of it. Uh, it, was, it seems remote, but it was just the suspension between earth and sky, between heaven and earth and uh, the wind blowing against my face. And it really, it was an awakening. That's how I put it. I awakened to the beauty of the earth in that moment. And I knew that there was something much greater than myself. And I knew that the conduit to that greatness was through the hands of my parents who have since passed away, but they're still with me on that mountain peak in, in Berchtesgaden. And I can still feel that, that their presence. And uh, that's why I'm a ranger. I'm a ranger because of Berchtesgaden, because I I grew up in the inner city of Detroit. I grew up with uh, concrete or asphalt and steel and glass and um, an urban, inner city urban environment. There was no visits to national parks at that point. There, were, there was no connection to the, the wildness of the earth at that point. The connection was through memory and that, that, that memorial of light that was Berkta's God and stayed with me. And I think that's what directed me and inflected me towards the experience of becoming a national park ranger. Without Germany, I would not be a ranger. Without Berchtesgaden, I would not be the ranger that I am. So, uh, Dankeschön, I really appreciate that, that, uh, that, that birth that you provided for me, that second birth into the, to the world. 
Oh yeah, that's a quite quite a strong connection. Sounds like like the start uh, for your love for nature. So, uh, Klaus, you also have a close connection in return to the United States, um, where Shelton is from. So, how did that uh, come about? Like, where did that uh, start? Yeah. So, so first of all, I, I want to excuse my my uh, my bad English. So, I don't talk uh, talk English very often. So I don't uh, know so many words, but I hope uh, uh, it works out. So uh, if not, please, Claire, help me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I'm born and raised in, in Berchtesgaden, not exactly Berchtesgaden, um, a small town beside Berchtesgaden um, called Bischofswiesen. And in my direct neighborhood, there was a, a U.S. Army camp, a U.S. community with all yeah, uh, what uh, with schools, kindergarten, um, sport place, whatever. And uh, after school, we we went we we took our bicycles and we went to America and we we played with the with the children over there. And one day we played baseball, the other day we played soccer. And uh, uh, yeah, it was it was uh, for me it was was normal to 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 to, to yeah to 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 be with the Americans. And um, later on, my father had a filling station in Beatrice Garden, and it was an excellent filling station, of course. Americans uh, came for gasoline filling station, and so uh, I was always connected to, you, to the United States. And it was just a, for me; it was just a question of time when, when I go to, uh, to to the United States. And uh, and in uh, 1987, and I started that trip. It was very very uncommon back then. And uh, I, I went there to um, to Minnesota, to lose to lose Minnesota. And uh, there are two ski areas up there. It's a Spirit Mountain and Monte Lac. And I worked at uh, Monte Lac o overnight and making snow in that area. And it, uh, yeah, it was, a, was a, a, a nice experience for me. And uh, of course, first time I saw that uh, uh, these, these, these dimensions in the United States, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't um, believe it before. And uh, yeah, it was, it, it was uh, pretty good. Um, um, well, you know, in, in this time, nature was not uh, so in first case for me, it was several different things. Uh, but I took uh, 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 two more trips to the United States in the uh, early 1990s. And then I started with my girlfriend back then. We visited uh, a few of, uh, of the national parks and um, uh, more in the southwestern part of the United States. And um, what I sure remember, and I, I told Chelton before, the first mm -hmm. time I, I saw... Uh, I saw the Grand uh, Grand Canyon National Park. It was so amazing. This is uh, I, I I would never forget this. This is really really something, you know. And uh, yeah, I can I can say that my love for nature is uh, yeah on on one side born uh, in in to my trips uh, to the United States, and on the other side, of course, that's what Megan told you before, uh, my fishing trips uh, with my father. Uh, so on uh, on weekends we we went to Austria. It's, we uh, we live close to the border, and uh, yeah, we had uh, our tent and uh, fireplace and whatever, and uh, fishing of course. And uh, yeah, I mean that's that's things uh, you never forget, you know. And uh, that uh, yeah, all night long, <laughs> all, all all life long, yeah. Okay, thank you, Klaus. So. Um... Shelton, you worked in uh, Yellowstone National Park and now working in Yosemite, Yosemite National Park uh, as a ranger. So how does uh, your typical work day look there as a ranger? Um, what, what are your main tasks and duties there? Well, my, uh, basically, I was an I've been an interpretive ranger for over 25 years. And, basic and what that essentially means is that I'm a science communicator, I'm a nature communicator. But uh, that's a, in my own mind, that's a boring way to describe what I do. What I think of myself as, I think of myself as a facilitator of astonishment. Uh, it's not on a business card that says astonishment facilitator. But when you're giving a program, a presentation, and it's your job to connect people to the environment that is beneath their feet, that is all around them, all the way up to the sky. Uh, when, you, when you relay some bit of information, some fact that makes their eyes get wider, and it makes them catch their own breath uh, and they become excited. 
and they become literally astonished at what you're what you're communicating. Uh, I think that speaks to more what my job actually is, and that's why I prefer to think of myself as a facilitator of astonishment. Because if you're in a place like Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon, Zion, uh, Wrangell St. Elias, any national park in the United States, astonishment is an, an inevitability. If you are, if your eyes are open. If you're listening, if you're feeling, and your heart is as wide as the, the space around you, there is absolutely no other outcome except astonishment in this sense that the world is so much greater than you and that you're just such a small part of it, but you're part of it. And that's the most important thing to connect people to, to their own planet through these exalted uh, spaces that we call national parks, not just in the United States, but in Germany and throughout the world. So that's my job. To make those connections. So you you talk a lot and communicate a lot of, with people and visitors and give uh, tours or what uh, exactly would would it look like? Well, it would look like you'd meet a group of people in front of the visitor center and you'd go on a walk. I mean, I think that's just something that's innately natural for human beings to to go for walks. We spread all over the world just through walking. So you could walk for uh, you know ninety minutes for an hour. But essentially, at each stop, you're conveying a little bit of information. You go to the next stop, you're conveying a little bit of information. But it's like building a house that they will step into brick by brick at each stop. You're adding a little bit more to the structure that you're creating, uh, literally on the wind, so to speak. And that's that's a walk. Uh, sometimes you're uh, sitting, could be around a fire, uh, but not normally. Normally, you're just sitting at the center of a group. Uh, in a campground uh, with, the, with the, the trees above them, you know, the ponderosa pine, the incense cedar above them, and they can see Glacier Point off in the distance, uh, silhouetted against the sky, and you're telling a story. I mean, essentially, the job of an interpretive ranger is telling a story, but in this case, it's the story of Yosemite, it's the story of the national parks, but really it's, it's all about Yosemite, the, the geology. The soils, the plants, the, the insect life, the bird life, the, 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 the mammals, and how all of that is interrelated and connected and how all that flows together. And uh, that's, it's really the, the job of anchoring people to where they are at that point, which is in one of the most beautiful places in the world. That's, my, that's the job, getting people connected. Sounds fantastic. Okay, so Klaus, uh, what is how does your uh, job look like? Your typical workday in Berchtesgaden, like also as a ranger, what are the similarities to what just Shelton described, and what's what's different, perhaps? So, so I think there's no no typical typical day because uh, every day is 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 totally different. Uh, but the, the first thing. Um, so our national park uh, is, is very, very small, uh, let me say that way. And, uh, but the, the good thing is, so we can come together every morning. So uh, we come together with our supervisor in the morning and uh, we are 15 ranger uh, in, the, in the national park. And uh, yeah, we, we meet each other every morning and, um, and then uh, we see what's to do uh, on that day. We have uh, three main uh, valleys in the national park. Uh, where the most um, tourists are. So we want one ranger in each valley every day. And then uh, we have a, a real good program for tourists. Uh, we have guided tours every day, uh, six days a week. Um, uh, yeah, different teams, uh, golden eagle, plants, uh, whatever. And uh, so we have to do this. And then we have information points in the national park, the national point of the golden eagle, of course. Uh, we have an information house. There's one ranger in there. So, um, and then we see where, uh, who, who's gonna do this and do this. And uh, yeah, so one day I, I go to Lake Königsee. Uh, I can uh, go around there with a, with a small boat and, and look on the shores as everything is fine or all the people who are camping illegal or stuff like this. Then I go to San Bartolome and I made a, made a guided tour there. And of course, afterwards, I, I do the same that Shelton said. I talk to the people and uh, connecting people. And uh, at Beatrice Garden, uh, it's sure the same that uh, Yosemite, we have uh, guests from all over the world. And uh, yeah, talking to the people. And the next day is totally different. I don't know. I go to the Klaus Bach Valley or uh, watching eagles or, or whatever, you know. So, uh, I mean, that's the, the, the very good point of our work. It's, uh, it's uh, never the same. It's always, always different. And you meet uh, different uh, people every day. So, it's, uh, yeah, it's really good so far, yeah. 
Okay, so you also do a lot of uh, communications with uh, visitors, but also a bit of extra, uh, also additional other work. So um, just a quick question out of interest, Shelton, how many do you know, how many rangers you have in Yosemite? Because we just heard from Klaus, like 15 people here in Bechtesgaden, but just to compare. Uh, uh, the official number is not enough. <laughs> we can always have... Have, have more rangers, but you know, you're looking at dozens of people. I mean, there, there are more personnel in Yosemite in terms of the National Park Service itself than most other national parks. Uh, so we have, a, we have a, a large operation, not that so much that we're la a large park compared to Yellowstone or Wrangell St. Elias, but it's a very complex or, or, you know, organization. And there's a lot of compl complexity to our visitation and complexity to lots of other issues that, that impact us given that we were in California the most populous state in the country. And the fact that we're a world heritage site. So people come here from all over the world all the time. So all of those complexities kind of are layered and they play into each other. And so it makes Yosemite um, a, a challenging place to manage if you are a, pack, mm -hmm. a park manager, because there's things you don't have control over like global warming, uh, climate change. You have no control over that. It's more of a reactive posture that you have to have. You have to look at what's happening and then make the decisions accordingly. But it's a, it's a very calm, just like Berkshire's Garden, it's a very complex environment. And I think that far too often we don't see the relationships between parks uh, on one side of the world to the other side of the world and how we sometimes are faced with the same problems, but we may not all come up with the same solution. And that's why communication such as what we're having right now, these, these, these dialogues are so important. To share to share our problems and hopefully share our solutions yeah so speaking about like problems and also one would be like uh, to raise more awareness and change perceptions like one of the challenges uh, i think both we also face in germany and in the united states so last week there was uh, we celebrated earth day so how do you think um days like can raise awareness and change perception so um, that question goes to both of you perhaps uh, Shaitan you want to start well I think one, one of the ways to change perceptions is, is is really part and parcel of what I'm doing now I'm the community engagement specialist for Yosemite so my job is to connect the disconnected those those Americans who don't necessarily feel a sense of kinship with national parks a sense of cultural inheritance of the national parks, I always want to convey a, a, a sense of ownership that every American owns the national parks, owns the Grand Canyon, owns Zion, Canyonlands, Arches, all the parks are part of their uh, inheritance. And for some populations, the word inheritance is not applicable because there's not a lot of wealth that's coming in or no wealth whatsoever. People often are inheriting poverty. They're, in, they're an inheriting injustice, a, a legacy of injustice. And so it's a challenging thing to communicate to those folks that the parks belong to them, that Yosemite is part of their birthright. But that's, that's the job that I'm in right now is to, is to, is to make that communication. Um, so um, it's, 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 it's complicated, but, but national parks are complicated. But we have to understand the people on our borders and the people who don't even dream of visiting a national park. And that's really what I'm doing right now is just to make certain that people uh, who are American citizens, people of color, who are African-American or Latino, Latina, Asian-American, who historically have not felt a sense of welcome in the national parks, now feel that sense of welcome. And uh, that's the, those are the messages that we need to be communicating and we are, but we have to make certain those messages are actually being received by the people that uh, are hopefully are listening. And that is really what will save the parks here in the United States to a great degree is uh, con continuing those connections and, and, and shaping those connections and forging them so that every American feels a sense of ownership of places that uh, for some are remote and have very little to do with their day-to-day -day lives. And that's the challenge right now. All right, thank you, yeah. That's definitely um, a big challenge, yeah. Um, so, so Klaus, uh, what what do you think about that? Well, well, I think Earth Day is a, is a is a good thing to 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 bring nature with all the beauty, all the problems, and whatever back to the to the brain, to the people. But um, um, yeah, on the other side, I think it, it makes me a little bit sad, you know, that that we we need days like Earth Day. Um, 
to, to bring it to the mind of the people, you know. Um, in my opinion, every day should be a rest day and, uh, and uh, the people, um, yeah, should, should be, get more used to, to nature. And um, it, it is a good thing. It is a good thing uh, um, to, to, to bring it back to their mind. But uh, yeah, it makes me a little bit sad. And yeah, yeah, like I said, every day should be a rest day. That would be the right thing. <laughs> so, what in uh, what would you say would help to raise awareness, or what is helping in your um, experience? Uh, excuse me. Can can you uh, can you say it in, in German, please, Claire? Um, was was uh, was ist denn für die uh, in deiner Erfahrung hilfreich in um, eben um, Uh, awareness eben zu, zu, uh, 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 zu, zu uh, steigern, eben <laughs> die Leute zu erreichen. Um, uh, yeah, it is, uh, like, like we said before, it's just talking to the people, that's, that's uh, the, the main thing we can do. Uh, and uh, yeah, talking to the people, that's it, yeah. Okay, communication, yeah. I think that's a shared uh, opinion between you two. It's good. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the all surrounding topics this year is, of course, uh, COVID. So how would you to say, like, has the pandemic affected your work? Has it affected your work? And in only has it affected it mostly in bad parts? Or are there also some good parts of the pandemic for nature and national parks? Um, what would you say, uh, Shelton, how has it affected your work? It's affected uh, my work here and the work of rain throughout the national park system, because when when something of this magnitude is happening, not just around the world, but also in the United States, people obviously in times of, of disaster or times of struggle like this, they seek shelter, they seek reprieve. It's like a ship at sea in a storm trying to find safe harbor. And for many folks who love the national parks and have some of the, their greatest memories of literally from childhood of being sheltered, if you will, in these environments, they want to seek that shelter in this biological storm of a pandemic. And so that creates its own problems for, for the park and for the parks in general, not specifically Yosemite, because you're managing people and so much of park management is not so much managing the wild of it, but managing the people who come to enjoy the parks. You have to exercise that and communicate you know, social distancing. You know, keeping people separate from each other, uh, keeping people, uh, you know, so that they're wearing masks when they happen to go indoors. Um, all the protocols that are in place through our, our CDC, um, we have to follow that and we have to communicate that. And so really what we're doing more than anything else is also um, we're, we're exemplars of the behavior we wish to see in the public. So rangers in Yosemite Valley and elsewhere in the park, we're wearing masks, we're, we're uh, exercising social distancing, we're modeling the behavior we wish to see among our visitors so that they will also model that behavior when they take it home. And we're communicating the importance of it without having to say necessarily the importance of it. And so that's, that's kind of where we are right now. And we, we have raised uh, slightly the cap on the number of people who are visiting Yosemite. We've tried to keep the numbers down because it is a pandemic, but we've, we've, we've made that, that, that space a little bit more accessible in terms of, of numbers because it's Yosemite. Again, we're a World Heritage Site and California is the most populous state. And so we have a visitation of around 5 million people a year. You know, so the result is, is that you, you, it's a difficult place to either have the door partially open. It's either open completely or it's closed completely. That's easier, you know, physically, but to have it open and, but restricted, that's where the challenge comes in. That's where the juggling comes in, in terms of valuation of what's more important, what's less important. How do we ameliorate? How do we mediate? How do we make certain that people have a great experience, but at the same time are not compromised of, by, by the health emergency that we're all dealing with right now. So did you have a, a higher uh, visitor increase, visitor uh, stream, or is it mainly just a struggle to, uh, with social distancing? Well, uh, visitation is constant. It's always increasing in Yosemite. It's Yosemite. Um, so, you know, when I arrived in the park, it was around, and this was in 19, um, let's see, 93, uh, I arrived in Yosemite. It was about, uh, I think, not even quite 4 million, around 4 million. And now it's over 5 million, just in that length of time. 
So just the, 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 the time that I've been in Yosemite for over 25 years, the visitation has increased by over a million people every year. And, and so that's, that's, that's part of the problem. A phrase that often is used here in the States is parks being loved to death, that people are so enamored of their national parks, their weekends uh, spent in national parks, their childhoods to some degree spent in national parks, except for some communities who have not uh, felt that messaging that parks are part of their inheritance that uh, obviously the numbers will go up, but it's just more challenging to deal with those numbers when there's a health emergency. Because let's face it, parks are medicine. And people, when they think of what's happening right now, they always have these memories of being uh, in the Mariposa Grove, a giant sequoia, in the natural cathedral that is Yosemite. And that's medicinal in its impact. And so when people feel like there's an affliction affecting the planet, they want to find that place that has that medicinal value, that curative value. And for a lot of people in the United States, the parks are that uh, uh, prescription, if you will, uh, that can supply a cure, in, at least psychologically, to what ails, what is ailing the population. Yeah, I think like a lot of visitors, that's also a big problem in Bechtesgaden. Garden. Um, so how would you say has uh, the pandemic affected your work, Klaus? So, yeah, um, I think it's, uh, for us, it's, there's, yeah, just, just a few more problems and uh, bad stuff. So, but, um, so as you know, it's uh, now almost one year that the people can, can travel, can go on vacation, stuff like this. So uh, of course they they want to go outside and they want to do something out outdoor. That's uh, yes, I can understand this and that I think it's the right thing. Uh, but now we have uh, a lot of uh, people. They are um, they do in day trips and when you think about it, that Munich is about um, one and a half or two hour drive uh, from Berchtesgaden National Park and um, Munich are uh, 1.2 million people and. Uh, so, so we have really, really a, a lot of people here every day, and um, of course, what they do, we have no uh, no hotels, no 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 restaurants, and nothing. So, uh, they they come with their mobile homes or trucks or even cars and stay there over the weekend, sleep in the cars, and uh, most of them don't have toilets in their cars, and um, and so you you won't you won't know how the how the the, the, the parking lots look on on, on Monday and. Uh, how many garbage and stuff uh, there's around. Um, you know, in, in, in that everyday life right now, the people have, have uh, so many restrictions and they can do this and they can do this. They can go shopping, they can go to the hairdresser or whatever. Um, and then, and then they, won't, they won't go um, outdoor, they won't go hiking and whatever. And, uh, and when they do this, they don't want any more um, restrictions there. But I mean, that's, that's the main problem for us. Um, it, it is still a national park. It, it doesn't matter if it's uh, COVID or, or not. It is a national park. And, um, and you know, when you talk to the, to the people, um, you see that they, um, um, how can I tell it? They, it, the, uh, it's a high, high, high tension level. You know, the, the, the people are a little bit aggressive. And then when you say, well, I'm very sorry, but uh, put your dog on the ledge and they, they don't understand it. They do it for, for about five minutes. And when you're around the corner, they, they, they let them off. And, uh, and so I think uh, I can, I, I really can understand the people, you know, cause uh, they, they want to do this and they, they, they want to go out outside and do their, their exercising or whatever. But um I see that, um, yeah, like I said, it's uh, it's uh, it's a problem, and it's still a national park, and we have to we have to to look for it, and we have to look uh, that everything is right. So I think that, um, yeah, this is a uh, the bad part uh, uh, of the of the COVID thing. Yeah. So I guess one can summarize that uh, for both of you, there has been a struggle to deal with the. Um, with social distancing in the parks, but there's also an understanding for like the need uh, for na of nature um, from the visitors. So um, last week, uh, turning to uh, other subject, um, there was the US uh, Missions Germany's Transatlantic Innovation Week. So, uh, and this is this uh, discussion is part of this. 
So is there any digital component uh, of your work um, uh, and or is it just largely uh, dependent on the real life experience or are there any yeah, digital or innovative uh, parts um, which, you are, which you are dealing with in your book? For that question is for, for who? It's, it's for both of you. Um, perhaps you can start, Shelton. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing to keep in mind is that we have visitors who come to the park, plan their trip and, and are here. But we also have visitors who visit the park uh, virtually, you know, through our website. And through that website, uh, you know, we, we, we work with young people who are trying to get their, their junior ranger badge or patch. Uh, we work with uh, uh, people who are just trying to get specific information about some aspect of Yosemite's natural history or cultural history. I mean, the, it's a pretty wide uh, canvas as, as far as what, what people are interested in when they contact the park. Um, so we, we're dealing with that as well. But I've also found that, that uh, the, the virtual reality is a means of connecting people who are disconnected from the park. It's a means of taking the parks literally to the people, which was actually an innovation that took place you know, back in the 1960s and 1970s, not everyone feels uh, that that historic connection to them and they don't really understand the park idea, the national park idea, unless they've had a national park experience. So it's also just communicating uh, something as simple as how national parks differ from uh, regional parks or county parks or state parks or city parks and, uh, and, and translating what we mean by a national park experience versus uh, some of the experiences that people may be more used to you know, that live in urban areas. I'm thinking of, for example, Central Park, um, you know, in New York or Golden Gate Park in, in San Francisco. Uh, there's a wildness to Yosemite. There's a wildness to the Grand Canyon, to, to other national parks that uh, cannot be mirrored in some of these other environments. So uh, there's a cultural translation to a natural setting, a wilderness setting. And so that's something that also is conveyed uh, remotely, you know, through the internet, through Zoom, just as we're doing right now. So that way people have a greater sense of what a park is, what a national park is to be precise versus other parks that exist in, in the United States. So I would say we're, there's always a process of communication and exchange of information so that people are mindful of the fact that these places are not just unique environments, but some of the greatest environments uh, that, that exist. And I'm referring to national parks globally, not just national parks in, in the United States. It is a common inheritance to all of humanity, all the parks, um, but, we, but there's, a, there's a downside to that. Most parks are not big enough to contain entire ecosystems. So uh, an issue in a park is bigger than the park boundaries. It, it extends beyond the boundaries to embrace other areas that are urbanized. So all of these complexities, are, are, are issues that we can communicate to the public about when they're on a ranger program, or if they're com communicating with us remotely through the internet and we get, we get messages from all over the world. So there's always a, a hub of conversation between uh, national park personnel in Yosemite and, and many of the other, most of the other national parks, all of them for that matter, uh, and the rest of the planet. And I think that Klaus would uh, probably has something similar, you know, with Berchtesgaden and, and in terms that people want to visit Berchtesgaden and they're, they're, they're from another country uh, in Europe or uh, elsewhere in the world. And so I, I'm always intrigued by this uh, interconnectivity that exists between all parks, not just here in the United States, but around the world and how we're all engaged in the same work of, of communicating what makes our own specific geography uh, unique in the world, and which makes the, obviously the world itself a unique environment for all of humanity. And everything else that we share with that humanity, all other creatures, large and small and everything else. Yeah, so I guess I can't, um, can't really replace like the wilderness of uh, the real life experience of national parks, but I guess it can definitely help to facilitate the communication and spread the message more. So Klaus, do you also have um, methods, uh, what, what digital components in your work that you use in Bechtesgaden? Garden? Uh, well, well, I think first of all, and it, that's the communication with the people out there in the park, but uh, of course time changes and, 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 and we changed uh, our um, 
art of uh, communication too. So we started out, you know, in, with, with newspapers, uh, stuff like this. And then we, of course, we use the internet and uh, uh, we do in Facebook, Instagram and whatever. And I think uh, that's okay and that's fine uh, as long as you reach the people. Um, every medium is okay, you know, internet or whatever. But um, yeah, the, the, the main thing is to talk to the people in the park uh, out there. I mean, that's, that's yeah, nothing compares to that. But uh, of course, we, 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 we use different things. And um, so we had the, the, the last years always the, the problem. So Sheldon wears a, a nice uniform and the, 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 the rangers out in, uh, in, in the US, uh, they, they have those, this mounty head or, or how you call it. So we don't have it, but, uh, but uh, we sure, we sure um, uh, make us. Um, so what can we do that the people um, recognize us as a ranger? And, and we changed it. You know, when, when, you, when you look at my shirt, this is a, an older shirt. You can see this was the, the sign we had uh, till last year. And uh, now we have, uh, it looks like this, you know. It looks like this and you see then the people know from far away, ah, here comes Ranger and I can ask him. And uh, the same thing is uh, we have a patch like this and this is almost the same, the, the, the Bavarian police I had and it's Ranger on it. And so, so uh, yeah, it looks a little bit better and, uh, and, the, and the people will, will recognize you uh, uh, very soon. And I think that's very good. So, so uh, same thing Sheldon said, we are still going on and still going on and uh, um, yeah, and, and want to get better and better to reach uh, people and talk to people, of course. So about reaching people, yeah, uh, I think uh, Sheldon also mentioned it earlier um, that you're also especially like also interested in reaching the younger generation. So um, how interested is like the younger generation in national parks? What's your experience and how do you, um, yeah, how do you, attract this younger generation in your respective work environments? Well, one of the things that you have to do is find out how they communicate, meaning young people communicate with each other in terms of social media, in terms of the virtual world. And then you have to craft your messaging so that that, that message that you're transmitting will be received by the group that you're trying to reach. And uh, that's a huge part of the, of the challenge right there is that there's so many young people who are so invested in virtual reality they have no idea that that reality itself so greatly transcends anything that can be captured uh, on a smartphone or on a, tele, on a, on a computer screen. And so, uh, but you see it even here in Yosemite, you see people that are in the Mariposa Grove, a giant sequoia, in the presence of the largest trees on earth by volume of wood, and they're on their devices, or they're, they're taking a photograph, which is a way of capturing that moment, but it also disengages you from that moment. Uh, when you're in the presence of a, in a, in a cathedral, and a, a, a sequoia grove is naturally a cathedral, you should not have anything that is screening you from what it is that you're there to experience. And, and that's really more than anything we try to communicate to young people that they have this inheritance in our national parks. And when you're there, it's best to be fully there, not there virtually, but immersed in that environment because the environment itself is grabbing hold of you. And I think as a species, we're, we've lost a little bit of that. We, we, we put up these layers between ourselves and the world and we need to tear down those layers, peel them away. And so that we are naked to the world again in the sense of being open the way that the wildlife around us and all other life is open to the world around us. And we need to rekindle that kind of connection and parks are the best way to, to forge that new, that relationship, which is actually very ancient. But I think it's important that we do that. Yeah, definitely. So, Klaus, do you have anything else like um, how to attract the younger generation? So, so uh, what well, I have to say, you know, our national park has a really, really good uh, program for children. And um, in the summertime, we have uh, each and every day four to five school classes here for guided tours. And I think that's, uh, that's very important. And um, when you talk to children there and people, uh, the, the, the children, they know a lot of things. And I say, well, how do you know this? And they, they say to me, well, my grandfather told me that, my grandmother told me that or whatever. 
And um, these are the children from our area, but uh, from time to time, you have children from Munich or from the big cities. And, uh, and then it's scary. It's scary. They don't know anything. And, uh, and, um, but of course, no one tells them. And, and, and when you talk to parents or to the, to the grownups, they don't even know it by herself. So, so they, can, they cannot tell it to the children. So, so I think that's, that's uh, very important. And, um, and um, of course, this is so, so, so much work. We have volunteers here in the National Park. Uh, they do the guided tours with children. And I think it's uh, a very, very important. And I think it's the most important part in our, in our work uh, right now and, uh, and for the future. You know, when I, when I think about my father, he's uh, 82 years old now. So I don't have to tell him anything. You know, it's, he has his own, his own mind and that's it. But uh, um, talking to children and, and I mean, that's, that's really the most important thing we can do. So we, we do this, uh, this program in the National Park, which is about two to four hours, you know. And, uh, and the thing is uh, not to tell the children, this is this plant and this is this plant and this plant and this plant and this tree. Uh, I think it's uh, important. To, 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 to give the, the children a good time in, in nature. So, so that's what they remember. And um, um, a second thing is um, what I think is very, very important to do um, like work camps with the children, you know, to, to um, stay with the children for one week uh, uh, and, uh, and work out there, plant trees or whatever. And so the children get part of nature. And uh, I think... Um, they don't know uh, every one of us is part of the nature, but uh, most of the people don't know it. And, and I think um, when, when you do, let, let, me, let me name it work camps, you know, if you do things like this, where you cook together and, uh, and uh, do several things, uh, they are very important too. I mean, that, that uh, protecting nature thinking doesn't end at the border of the, of the national park. I mean, it's, uh, uh, every day, our everyday doing of uh, what we eat, uh, how we travel, and whatever. So, so I think um, that would be a really good uh, good thing to get to, to get to the children and then talk to the children and show them that way. And I think that's very important because I know I did it uh, before and I, I still do it as a voluntary work, um, uh, doing work, uh, camps with children. And, uh, and they go home and they say, well, we have to do it this way or this way. And uh, the father comes to me next day and says, what, are, what did you tell my, my, my son? I cannot eat uh, meat every day or whatever. And uh, I think that's, that's really important. That's, um, for me, it's the most important uh, part of our work uh, uh, getting getting the children and, and talking to the children and um, and uh, yeah making their mind taking bring them to take care of nature yeah I think that's the most important part of our work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you a lot for that for those answers. Um, looking at the time, we'll start now with the Q and A. So with the questions from the chat. Um, so the first one would be, um, what do you consider best, uh, the best next steps to intensify the sister park relationship between Yosemite and Bechis Garden National Park? So between uh, our two national parks, how can we um, strengthen that relationship? Who's, who's first? Um, you go ahead. Okay. I think that the, the best way to strengthen any relationship is, is conversation, is communication. And so instead of speaking to each other, you know, once every few months or once a year, we need to have more regular conversations. And, have, and by having those regular conversations and having that fluidity of, of communication, um, issues will come up that, uh, that we can talk about. And uh, we already have this kind of set in place uh, sense of Connectivity, a connection. We know if I'm talking to Klaus every other week or so, I know Klaus, and and we can. And so the conversation doesn't end when we stop talking on that day. It continues, and he'll have uh, something, an insight that he hadn't had before, or I'll have an insight that that was not delivered to me before, and we can build on that. And that, and that having that relationship, a relationship between rangers in all the parks all over the world. Rangers don't talk to each other enough around the world and rangers are faced with problems every single day and may have no idea that another park in another nation has dealt with that same problem because they are at a similar latitude, a similar longitude 
or, or just similar elevation and they have the same challenge, but they've come up with a solution. So I think so much could be solved if, if parks and park employees, park uh, rangers spoke to each other or had a means of communication on a regular basis. Uh, because I like talking to class. I want to keep talking to him. Yeah, I think he enjoys talking to me. And it's, it's finding those similarities of, of, that are problematic and finding those, those, those solutions in that conversations, in those conversations that, that we all need. So helping each other, we help the world is my way of thinking of it. And, and we don't have enough conversations like the one that we're having right now. So I'm planning on talking to Klaus after this conversation, after these conversations are done, because I want to know what's happening in Berkeley's garden, because that was part of my childhood. And even though I've not been there since I was a kid, I love Berkeley's garden because it was that awakening for me. And, you know, Klaus loves some of the parks here in the United States. And I can see him, he's smiling right now and I can see that. And uh, I think that's important as well, that we share that, that affection, that love that we have for these places around the world. And so then they're not just in another nation of, foreign nation, there's just another part of our own backyard. Yes, yeah, so uh, like you're saying, I think we have a lot of similar challenges. Uh, one of those challenges in Bechtsgaden at the moment is um, with, uh, with certain hotspots which are popular for Instagram selfies like the waterfall. So mm -hmm. this question would be to Klaus, like how does the national park deal with uh, those situations, with the waterfall or Instagram hotspots? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's one of the main problems. Uh, but first of all, I want to say, uh, I, I think the same that Sheldon said. Um, so we, uh, um, we a national park in Berchtesgaden or Yosemite, we, we try always new things to get, um, uh, yeah, to get the things done. And uh, I think it's very important that uh, the basic, uh, we are talking together because, uh, you know, uh, we tried uh, a new thing and it works so why shouldn't it work in in california so i think that's uh, or otherwise so i think that's that's really important uh, that we uh, uh, that we are in touch and uh, i'm i'm sure uh, shelton we, we we are on the phone the next couple of days and 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 uh, uh, talk to each other um well uh clear what you said about the the instagram hotspot at the waterfall i mean that's that's really a problem for us and uh uh, we tried uh, a lot of things, you know, we, we like I said, we, we, we had um, the reports in the newspaper, we, we, uh, we used the internet, our homepage, of course, uh, Instagram, Facebook and whatever. Uh, and um, we, were, we were down there and talking to the people and, uh, but, but, you know, nothing, nothing helped. And uh, now um, we, we had this decision, uh, we closed the area. And um, I mean, that's, that's really special. I mean, it's the first time in Bavaria uh, um, we, we do this. And uh, uh, we, we don't want to do this, but I think it's the last uh, thing, the last, uh, uh, yeah, the last chance we have. Um, we have uh, such a, uh, uh, the vegeta vegetation is, 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 uh, is gone, you know, it's really, um, uh, a great, a great damage there, and and um, yeah, we we are a national park. We are the highest level of, of protected areas, um, and we we don't have any other choice. And and, and uh, we have we have to to do it now. And I, I'm not sure yet, but I think uh, we start in in in, in May uh, when we close that area, and we have um, a, a few ranges then there. They they. Uh, uh, they look around and if uh, they find people in there, then, then they get a ticket and they have to pay. So we don't want this and we don't uh, think that's for us, it's not the, the best uh, thing, but but it's the only thing we can do now. And uh, and uh, yeah, we have to do it. And it's our duty, you know, we have a, a protected area and uh, yeah, we have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Does this problem sound familiar to you, uh, Shelton? Like, do you have similar problems and how do you, if so, if you, how do you deal with those? Well, actually, if, 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 if Klaus had not said or stayed at Berchtesgaden and stayed at Yosemite, we could have, we share the exact same issue. We have the same challenge with people doing selfies on the edge of a precipice, trying to capture that photograph showing where they are. We have people who 
you know, walk through a, a meadow in the spring when it's particularly vulnerable to that kind of physical impact. And they're not thinking about how they're damaging the soils or how they're damaging plants. They're just thinking about what a great spot for a photograph. And if only one person did that, it, wouldn't, it would still be a, a big deal. But when it's replicated by millions of people, that's called a, a socialized or a social trail. And the valley has social trails because people have just walked off the trail to get a particular photograph. And enough people have done that to get that photograph that a new trail has been created or, or a cutting switchbacks going up a, a, a almost, ver not a vertical slope, but a steep slope uh, to, to get there faster. And so really what this comes down more than in, to anything else is getting people to slow down. We have a car culture that uh, people are always in a hurry. They're always harried trying to get from point A to point B. And I'm talking fast right now, and I'm gonna talk slower so it's clearer that our society moves too quickly and parks are about slowing people down to a speed commensurate with nature. And if we can just manage that to get people to slow down, then they would have the time to read the sign that says, don't walk into the meadow. Don't walk over the railing to take a selfie because you will die or you may die. I think that's really an important thing to communicate that people don't realize they're in such great danger or causing such damage unless someone points it out to them. And there are not enough rangers to do that. And if you have so many signs to communicate it, then people will just say, look at all those signs in the meadow. Well, I can't see the mountain because there's so many signs there. I mean, we don't want to have that. We want people to see what they're there to see and feel and experience what they're there to feel and experience. But there's a balance between pointing out and being hidden so that they can see what, what they've come to experience. Thank you. As you just mentioned, like there aren't enough rangers. There's one question from the audience um, who's asking how one can work for Yosemite National Park and if it's possible as a European to work for US National Park or like how one can get training for being an interpretive ranger. Well, you can get training for being an interpretive ranger through the National Association of Interpretation. And they have a website, NAI, National Association of Interpretation. But you have to be an American citizen to be a national park ranger. But that doesn't mean that you cannot be a volunteer. And as a volunteer, whatever your specialty is, you can volunteer for that particular branch. You know, you could be a volunteer working for resource management. You could be a volunteer working with an ecologist or with a botanist or a wildlife manager. I mean, there's a variety of things that you can do in that capacity of a volunteer and just about every park has some aspect to it of volunteerism because we want people to be engaged with their parks and an even more powerful way to have that engagement is to volunteer. You get, you, you know, you get health, you get housing, you get a stipend and you get to live in places like Zion and Grand Canyon, Yosemite, Yellowstone, uh, sometimes outside the park, but the park becomes your home for a few months. And it's a very powerful way of deepening that connection to Yosemite by playing a role in its preservation and protection. Yeah, that sounds like a great option. So um, another question is, um, how does climate change or recent movements like uh, Fridays for the Future change the behavior of visitors? So like, um, it, does, it, does climate change and uh, does it change somehow does it have any um, impact how visitors have been behaving or talking to you perhaps also? I, I don't, I have not noticed any change in behavior as, as far as the visitors in terms of climate change. I've seen the behavior obviously culturally within the workplace. I mean, that's something that we're focused on, especially um, anyone that's invested in the preservation of, of species that are endemic to the park. I mean, uh, the way that I put it is the Sierra Nevada is the highest mountain range in the contiguous United States. And as such, if you gain an elevation or lose an elevation, you know, that habitat uh, differs markedly. So you can only go up so high if, you, if you're forced to move up to, to deal with env an environment in which, within which you've evolved, you can only go up so high before you run into sky. And if you run into sky, then you become extirpated. You are extinct in that, that particular space. And, uh, and that's what we're faced with here. We're faced with uh, the climate change is happening faster than, a, than an organism's ability to, to deal with that change because organisms are used to dealing with changes that take place over decades or centuries or thousands of years. And look at the human species, homo sapiens, look how much we've changed and yet how much we've stayed the same. 
but uh, you but organisms can't they're not moving at the speed of the changes that are taking place on the, in, in the, on the earth itself and that's why we're in, right now in the midst of a die-off of species and ex, uh, an extinction event is happening right now throughout the world but you don't usually hear about that uh, in the newspapers but but scientists have dealt with it and are dealing with it but then there's that also that gulf that exists between uh, scientists and lay, lay folks, lay persons, the regular people uh, about these topics. It's not a topic. You know, global warming is not a topic. It is some, it's an event that is happening. And the extir extirpation, the extinction of species is not a topic. It is something that is happening in, rain, in rain, tropical rainforests and environments all throughout the world. And so anything that's affecting the planet needs to be dealt with in a planetary way there's an, there's the other challenge right there with communication. We have the United Nations. We have this discourse that's happening at the global level, but it has not reached the the the, the regional level, the local level, the environments within which people live, and that's where it needs to be. Uh, it's like think, it's not just think local, think locally and act globally, but think locally and act locally. Do what you can where you are to to do as much to mitigate these impacts that are anthropogenic that human beings have created, not just for themselves, but for the world around them. Great. Klaus, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, how, how climate change uh, has impacted, um, if you've experienced any impacts so, on climate so change? I, I, I really have to say there's um, the behavior of the people, of the visitors, there's no change. Um, um, no, no, uh, not at all. So, so, yeah. Uh, no, I, I think there's. Uh, Sheldon said everything. That's enough. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Okay, so I've got one question to you directly, Klausi. So, was it always allowed for people from Munich to visit Bechtesgaden during the pandemic, or was there a time when one couldn't move the uh, um, see and go to the national park during the pandemic? Um, yeah. So, so. Uh, this is now almost one year, and we had uh, we had times uh, where it was not allowed, but most of the time um, it is allowed. Uh, so I don't want to say this, this, the people are not just from Munich; they are from the whole area. But uh, they come a lot of a lot of people come from Munich, of course. Um, uh, yeah. So we had last year in uh, I guess it was it started in, in in March, April, something like this. And we had uh, we had um, really no visitors in in our park, and it was uh, for me uh, it, it it was amazing, you know, when we went out there and, and, and no one was there, and you saw so many animals uh, right beside the the, the path, and uh, even at St. Bartholomew, which is uh, on Lake Königsee, which is uh, one of the hotspots, tourist hotspots, uh, you see uh, wild animals right beside the, the restaurant, the beer garden, because there was no one there. And uh, I mean, that was really that was really special for us too. And uh, but it was about uh, for two months, uh, one or two months, something like this. And then uh, and then when when they say, well, uh, you can uh, for day trip uh, uh, just. Uh, one, two person together or whatever. And then uh, they, they, yeah, they come over us. <laughs> and uh, um, like I said before, I, I, I can understand it. And the people have to go outside. That's, that's, that's for sure. But uh, yeah, uh, it's too much. <laughs> I, I mean, that's the same that Sheldon said before. Uh, if someone, uh, if one person goes out there and 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 and, uh, and and takes a picture or whatever, it's not the problem. But uh, the problem is, uh, he 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 put that uh, that picture on Facebook or Instagram, and the next day we have hundred people there, and then we have hundreds, thousands and 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 much more. And I think that's the that's uh, the, the problem we have. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there was basically a short amount of period for nature to like recover a bit, but then it basically exploded, yeah. I guess. So um, Sheldon, a question for you. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that your job is to connect to, uh, to the disconnected, but it seems social factors cause so many Americans to have difficulties taking pause and being present. So how do you help them take the sense of connection back to the land uh, and to their homes and apply to this uh, connection to their daily life then again? Well, I think that, uh, that in general, when you have a visit, whether it's a virtual visit to a national park or a, a real visit to a national park, 
it's a way of just suddenly getting you to stop. You know, it's like when a, it's like when a kid is having a tantrum, you know, and you do something that suddenly shocks them back. It's a reset. And they, 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 the, the brain, the frequencies and the, the brain waves starts, it, it, it stops or halts and it, uh, it, it, it wakes people up. And I think that uh, is, is one of the impacts of, of a park experience, whether it's a virtual experience, not as obviously as, power, as a powerful as an experience as one could hope for, but definitely a f the physicality of a national park has that uh, reset uh, impact. Um, but the problem is with, with work that I'm engaged in is that there are communities who historically have not felt as welcomed in these environments. And as a result, they need a, a greater encouragement to come to these environments because there's issues of their own physical safety or, or even psychological, emotional safety um, because of the history of separate and unequal that exists, exist, existed for people of color, communities of color for, for much of Americans, America's history. And so even though there are no laws that legally keep people out of these spaces, those laws no longer exist. They're, they've become a self-imposed restrictive rule that keeps uh, African-Americans or uh, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans or what have you out of the park experience because they've never felt that they were invited to these environments, to these spaces. So it's, 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 it's calibrating the frequency through which you are communicating and hope, hopefully are being heard. And, and that's really the, the challenge for the National Park Service at this point is to communicate a message that is being received by the people that you wish to hear the message. And that is a message of welcome. And there's very, there's nothing more powerful than when someone truly welcomes you into their home. And national parks are the home of all Americans. And to, because you see me as a World Heritage Site, it is the home for all people all over the world. But how you share that home, how you use that home, there's obviously rules in place to maintain the integrity of that home, the integrity of a national park, which is the home for the people. And so we have to balance that out as well. So those are all the challenges that, you know, that, that come into play. And, and my role as a community engagement specialist is to connect those populations that historically have not felt welcome to quote unquote America's best idea and to make them feel at home in an environment that at, at one point in their existence as a people might, they may have felt was not a welcoming was actually a more restrictive, even a hostile environment. But uh, that's that those are attitudes. And it's the attitudes that are keeping people at, at, out of the parks more than any kind of legal uh, ruling or, or physical force or threat that's keeping them out. Uh, parks are for people, all people, for all time. And that's, that's what we're communicating now. And, and I think that messaging is slowly being received by the people that we wished to hear that message and, to, and believe it's 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 truthfulness, it's veracity. That sounds great. Yeah. So that experience. Um, someone wants to um, in the chat said uh, that they would like to, if if it's possible, to volunteer um, uh, to with Claudie and uh, plant trees and learn about the environment. Are there what options are there? to experience this uh, in Berchtesgaden? Uh, so in, in Berchtesgaden, we have, we have uh, several poss possibilities. Um, uh, uh, first of all, uh, you can make the FJ, uh, which means Freiwilliges Ökologisches Jahr. It, it takes one year. Um, we have, uh, uh, it's called a Commerzbank Praktikum. It, uh, uh, takes uh, uh, three months or up to six months. We have um, uh, our uh, Golden Eagle, um, uh, Golden Eagle project, and we always uh, need volunteers there. They are three months, up to six months here. Uh, right now, we have uh, I think it's twelve uh, volunteers here that uh, help us watch <laughs> after our eagles. Um, yeah, we have we have several uh, possibilities, and uh, best thing is uh, to uh, to look at the homepage at our homepage, um, and uh, of course we can we can do some some special package. Uh, I want to say it that way. So if someone is interested in uh, golden eagles and uh, work of the rangers, so we can we can split it. You know, we can say well, uh, half time uh, with the golden eagle project, and the other side uh, on the other half. Uh, 
with with the rangers. So we have we have uh, really a lot of possibilities, and uh, of course the people always will come uh, uh, in our national park. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good overview for the opportunities here. So, Sheldon, um, how important are hiking permits uh, that you have in Yosemite to limit the impact of tourism um, in the backcountry? Um, how many visitors actually go on overnight hikes? You know, I don't remember the exact number, but it's a small, it's a, it's a small percentage compared to the overall visitation. Most folks are, are you know, in the, in the front country part of Yosemite. You know, they're in the Mariposa Grove, they're in Yosemite Valley, they're at Glacier Point, they're at Tunnel View, they're in Tuolumne Meadows driving through uh, a lot of those folks, uh, although that's a main corridor for wilderness access as well. So people are in, in known areas, and uh, but most of our visitation is to Yosemite Valley. That's the most famous area in the park. And when you go beyond our borders, our boundaries, that's what most people think of when they think of Yosemite. They think of they, they, oh, we're going to Yosemite. We, we want to see Half Dome. We want to see El Capitan. We want to see Yosemite Falls. You know, we want to see North Dome or, uh, and, then, and all those, what they just described as Yosemite Valley, or they want to see a giant sequoia. And they're probably thinking of the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoia, which is the most prominent grove of sequoia in Yosemite. So that's what people are thinking. And when they arrive and they speak to a ranger, just like with Klaus, they, they learn more about the park and realize that, oh, there's so much more that is available to us than what we've been told and what we've read online. And that's the experience, I call it the experience of, of, of the reconsideration of what to do once they're there, when they realize they're, oh, there's a place that I can go hiking that's much quieter than Yosemite Valley. And, and, and our response is just about anywhere in the park is quieter than Yosemite Valley. But at the same time, Yosemite Valley is one of the greatest natural cathedrals on planet earth. So why wouldn't you spend time there? but most people aren't willing to just watch the sunrise in Yosemite Valley or, you know, they're there for the sunset, but both are beautiful. So there's just, there's just co the communication of ways of experiencing Yosemite where the crowding that Yosemite is noted for is not as extreme as people think. It's a lot to do with timing. If you were to walk out on, a moon, on, a, on the night of a full moon in the Yosemite Valley at two in the morning, the ground is lit up, the trees are lit up. You can see the silica and the granite reflecting the light of the moon. It is absolutely a, a transcendent experience. And you may be completely by yourself. You could be just you in the meadow and the bears. <laughs> uh, or they may not be there. It just might be you, you uh, sit in the meadow, Cook's Meadow and, uh, and a coyote or a mule deer. You know, or a, or a fox, but um, but we're diurnal at creatures, and uh, so at, at night the Yosemite wakes up the night shift, and uh, most people aren't out at night unless they're astronomers or you know stargazers. But uh, I've walked out at night in Yosemite Valley during a full moon, and it is a, an incredible experience, primarily because it is Yosemite Valley, but it also it's quiet. And silence is an overlooked aspect of the, of the park experience and having stillness around you stills the soul, quiets the heart and spirit so that you can open like a window and let the breeze come in from creation itself. Yeah, I think it's also uh, similar to here. Like um, if you just, like you said, if it's just uh, depends on the time and where you go, you can still find solitude, even though it's a lot smaller here than Yosemite, mm -hmm. but it's still possible. Mm -hmm. So I've got next, I've got a question to the both of you. Uh, have the two national parks considered to start something like an exchange program for interns at some point in the future to strengthen connections? So like a uh, yeah, exchange of interns between the two national parks, I guess that's the question. Well, uh, I don't know about you, Klaus, but I would be more happy for a, an exchange of rangers. <laughs> Yeah, you know, because, me too. <laughs> me too. Yeah. I'd rather uh, be with Klaus and Klaus could be here, you know, here in Yosemite. I think that that would be more popular among the, the staff here or throughout our national park system. Because interns in general, usually that's specific through a secondary organization that, that serves as an in intermediary to tie those interns to the park experience. And I don't know of any system in place where interns th that start out in the United States, like the Greening Youth Foundation, for example, would send their interns to the Serengeti or to Berchtesgaden or to Amazonia 
but I know uh, plenty of rangers here who would be absolutely thrilled to go <laughs> to go to Berchtesgaden. And I'm certain Klaus would say that there's rangers in Berchtesgaden that would be quite happy about going to the Grand Canyon or Yellowstone. So the ranger exchange actually makes to me a, a little bit more sense because you already are dealing with personnel that have that uh, uh, expertise, if you will, on, on so many different aspects of, of park management that it would be a much better suited thing. And it would be an enrichment to their own career track, but also to their own job. When you go to a, a different environment a different, in a different park, in a different part of the world, that, uh, that experience will give you that uh, new lens through which you can see a problem you couldn't figure out before you had that experience. But just having that experience in that other park, in another part of the world, can deepen your, the understanding you have of, the own, of your own home, your own backyard. And I, I wish that that existed because I think it'd be a very powerful way of not only uh, making good rangers even better, but it'd be a great way of connecting parks that don't necessarily see that they have a sister park or brother park, however you want to put it, that uh, has the similar, uh, similar, faces similar challenges on a daily basis. We work together, we solve the world's problems. We work separately, then we're, it's provincial, it's local, and the problems are just piecemeal. But we need to have a collective effort. And again, that's why I think that, uh, you know, the rangers need to, to be more mindful and have a, a, an opportunity to share the stage with other rangers so that we can solve problems that are common to all. Exactly. <laughs> Klaus, yeah. you need to be here. We need to get you here. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so exactly, you, you're, you're right, uh, Sheldon. Um, so, you know, uh, now several years, we are sister national parks, we have this garden in Yosemite. And this is my first touch, my first contact with, uh, with this Yosemite National Park. This is now talking to you. Uh, <laughs> and I think, you know, um, we, 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 we just can learn from each other. Like, like we said before, we have the same problems and, and you do it this way, I do it this way. And, and who knows what's, what's, what's the better way. But, but when, we, when we are connected, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we can, we can learn from each other. And um, um, so we have this um, in Germany. We, 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 uh, once or two times a year, we, we meet uh, rangers from all over Germany. Uh, and talking together, and it's very interesting because because we have a total different um, um, protected areas. Uh, we are the only Alpine national park in, in Germany. But when I talk to people from 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 the Nordsee, uh, uh, they have problems like we have, and 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 we can learn from each other. And of course, um, I, I'm sure uh, we could learn from each other. So from the United States to to Germany, um, and uh, of course, and I want to I want to visit the Yosemite National Park once just to see you. <laughs> Sheldon and, and, and walk around with you a little bit and you, you, you show me your, your park. Uh, no, but I think we, we could learn from each other and that, um, yeah, I think it would be a good way, yeah, to do this, yeah. So the Ranger Exchange program seems like a fruitful idea that definitely needs to be followed up on. So we've got um, two more last questions. Uh, so question to Sheldon, uh, did you experience any interesting situations with animals in Yosemite. I, will, I like the, the use of the term interesting. Uh, well, in Yellowstone, I surprised a, a sow grizzly uh, with her three cubs less than about 20 feet away, which was the definition of an exciting experience with wildlife. Um, one of my jobs in Yellowstone was uh, the park courier. And during the wintertime, the park courier was in a snowmobile and you would drive through uh, Yellowstone to deliver the, the mail at the various locations in Yellowstone, like Canyon Village, um, you know, Mammoth Hot Springs is where I would begin, but also Old Faithful and so forth. And it was over 150 miles in one day on a snowmobile. And uh, you would go out and it doesn't matter how bad the weather was. It just was the response to my, from my supervisor was, big storm coming in, yeah, dress warm, uh, you know, so, it's, uh, it was an adventure. I mean, have exper the experience of uh, being nearly killed by bison that were at the canter running toward me, uh, having a disagreement with a coyote that was nipping at me as I was trying to drive past it, but it wouldn't let me go by it. You know, uh, it's just one thing after another. But uh, the, the advantage of that experience with the, power, the moment that I remember most clearly from that experience was just being in Yellowstone at a time when there was no one else there, but park employees to be in the world in one of the world's or the world's first national park 
and to feel like you have it to yourself is a very powerful experience. It, powerful is not the word to describe it. It would be like if Klaus had Bertus gotten all to himself, every trail he took, every view he went to, there was no one else there, just, just you in the mountains. And uh, when, you're, when I was that winter courier in Yellowstone, that was, that was the experience that I had. Until I arrived at each location, it was just me, bison, uh, and uh, elk occasionally, but mostly it was bison because the elk had moved to you know warmer warmer conditions, like warmer for the Rocky Mountains that is. Um, but uh, I think Klaus has probably similar memories that there's no there's something very powerful about a solitude, and uh, and every visitor should have that. And the more popular the park is, the less likely that they can have that experience. But that's what's wonderful about the whole notion of wilderness. You go out into the wild and you may not see very many people. As a matter of fact, you probably won't. And some people are discomforted by that. They are uncomfortable with their own solitary self surrounded by mountains, surrounded by sky. And for many city dwellers, that is an uncomfortable experience. But if, but if they open themselves to it, it is actually a nurturing experience. It was a, it's an experience of connection to something greater than yourself. Uh, so we, we tried as rangers to inculcate that, to facilitate that comfort at being in the wild. And that's, that's something that's very important with, with, with saving the world. It's not so much saving the world, it's saving ourselves for the world. Uh, but that's why I think that these experiences are so of, great, of such great value. Yeah, thank you. That was, uh, yeah, I think also like you mentioned, like those experience of solitude often then also go in hand in hand with those experiences in, with animals. Those are become more likely and can be quite powerful. So one last question before we wrap this discussion up. Um, Shelton, did you get any chance to learn German during your stay in Germany? Nein, it's, it's verboten. <laughs> No, I was I was five years old, so I'm certain I was picking up a few words here and there. But I, you know, I was in kindergarten, and so I, I, I and then after Germany, we moved to London, England, to Ryslip. And so, you know, it's a my German now. It's all it's Brahms, it's Beethoven, it's Schiller, it's 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 Heinrich Heine. It's it's all in translation, you know. Um, but uh, it'd be a great opportunity to be there and. Uh, work on my my German is a good yeah <laughs> yeah so I hope we can um you can get the opportunity to uh, study some more German so I guess um I'll wrap this up by thanking both of you uh, very much for your time and uh, answers uh, so to your audience I hope everyone could take away some value and we could uh, answer your questions uh, to satisfaction